Hello everybody, welcome back to another breakdown for American Horror Story Hotel. How's it going over there, Ryan? What's up with Finn? Uh, he's doing well, Greg. He is chewing on a toy on the ground right behind me. Hopefully he doesn't bark. But if he does, uh, just consider it a spoiler warning for the rest of this episode. We are on Shoots and Ladders, right, Greg? Episode 2. Let's do it. All right, this episode kicks off with Sally just looking out the window, just, you know, thinking of how life is as a ghost at the moment. She's smoking a cigarette. And it's a quick sig break because she looks over at Gabrielle, who's apparently, um, he's very comfortable, let's say, uh, extremely comfortable, as it looks like he's now the new Mattress King. Yeah, Greg, I, I you know, last time we left off, he was thinking that he was going to basically be killed or, like, pain-free. Mm -hmm. But clearly Sally lied to him. He had to go through that whole addiction demon uh, hazing ritual, um, and then he gets sewn into the mattress like the mattress king that we met last time. So apparently, maybe just numerous matches through ma mattresses throughout this hotel have people sewn into them. I'm guessing. Okay. She said it was his own damn fault too. He, uh, so he's going to be there for quite some time. I'm really digging this kind of love story dynamic between the two that's going on right now, where she just like you know caresses him and kisses him on the head before shoving his face in. It, it, it's cute. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, it's cool. And then right here is when we realize that there are other screams coming within the hotel itself, right? Mm -hmm. We go, it's that one shot of them going into the air ducts, and then you hear um, one of the Swedish ladies, the one that's still surviving, um, she is still getting uh, kind of tortured. Her blood is getting sucked from the little young vampires, and she's like on the brink of death. Eventually, she does die because she, uh, you know, uh, runs out of blood, and, and they As you do. Cut. You know, as you, as you do, do when you're, you know, <laughs> as they, yeah, as you as, slice someone's wrists and then you start sucking blood, like uh, she dies. But um, mm -hmm. Sally then comes down and says, you know, there's so much noise. Why are you guys screaming? Be quiet. There's a cop here now. You know, you got to be careful. And no one really seems to be bothered by that idea, right? They're like, kind of like no. a cop isn't really too much to worry about. Well, Iris does say that he wasn't there at the moment or something like that. Right. He was gone. He was back at the office. So, all right. Yeah. So Liz and Iris wheel the corpse down to. It looks like uh, it seems like they're just going to drop her down a garbage chute. We see Miss Evers again for a moment. She's going to clean the sheets. No matter how mm -hmm. much blood's on them, doesn't matter. She's got you. She's uh, apparently she's really really good at this. Um, Lots of bleach. Lots and lots of bleach. So right before they drop her down the chute, Liz gives this line about saying the Swedes. She how much she admires the Swedes for uh, their chocolate. And quickly before, I just remember looking up, going, "No, Swiss." And then, uh, of course, Iris beats me to the punch right before it. Chocolate's the Swiss. And at this point, you see that uh, a few bodies have stacked up in that kind of that pit, that 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 kind of garbage chute. Oh yeah. Um, Ugh. So we see, I think the previous Mattress King was down there, and then obviously her friend, uh, mm -hmm. the other Swedish Swedish tourist that was hanging out last episode. So they're both de down there dead. It looks like they might have dropped something on the body to kind of cover up, mask the smells that were going on there. Um, but basically, yeah. you, can, you can tell that this is like a, a tradition of just kind of... Uh, you know, killing people, using their body, the blood for the host of vampires that are in the hotel itself, and then expose, mm -hmm. uh, you know, disposing of the bodies themselves down the chute. Now, speaking of chute, um, obviously the title of the episode is Chutes and Ladders. Um, we all know the board game Chutes and Ladders. Um, it actually is a very ancient game that came from India. Um, I think it was originally called Snakes and Ladders, um, and even more originally known as Moksha Patam, which um, basically has been played since like second century AD. And it's kind of like a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a board game that we're familiar with, but basically, uh, you know, the farther you go, you, you, come in, you come across obstacles that either send you way back down or, you know, bring you back to the top. So it's kind of like a survival mm -hmm. of the fittest type game, right? You try to kind of avoid the obstacles and make sure you don't go down a chute and, and you want to go up a ladder. But... Um, multiple meanings on this, on this, of course, but l the literal meaning is there are shoots inside this hotel, a dungeon of <laughs> where a cavern, a cavernous dungeon where all these bodies are disposed of. Now we're back with the vampire children for another moment as we see they are on dialysis now um, as they were already feeding earlier. Now it's time for the Countess's turn and Countess and Donovan. Yeah. So Iris takes their blood, brings it to the Countess in a little decanter. <laughs> I like that. And then immediately, yeah. Ah, How perfect. refreshing, Greg. After a long day at work, Greg, you know, like you like to come home 
yeah. open up a bottle of that young blood and just pour it into your wine glass and just like you do, sit back, you know, relax, yeah. sit back, relax, and just enjoy the young, young blood of a, of of a, of a small child. Okay, wow. all right, that's enough. Anyways, Donovan wants to stay home and kick it and just watch House of Cards. Um, and apparently, I guess Count, the Countess knew she could see the future. She says, "Nah, I'm cool, on that, and I'm just gonna head out for the night and go on my hunt without you." So she goes, of course, to the outside of a museum, LACMA, I believe, and she just kind of wants to scope out the scene, like you know, look look for possible mm-hmm. targets. She's on the hunt. It's nighttime. She wants to, you know, she's she she's in the art world. She she. At least, um, you know, is a collector of some sorts of not only uh, art, but also collecting uh, people. So she goes out by herself and uh, just has a night on the town. And no- nothing really happens from here. I was like, what? did we really need to see this? Like it, nothing it, this it really scene, didn't bring us anywhere. This scene is awesome because it does something else. And it's the music. It is the uh, just Q Joy Division New Order right here and then, uh, which is, I, I, I don't know. I don't know how much uh, they went into this, how much surface level it was just to pick this track. But it is perfect for the Countess and the theme and the story and the episode. It is the perfect song to choose. Now, that song is Joy Division's In a Lonely Place, well, uh, via New Order. Now, Ryan, where were the Countess and Donovan in the last episode? Where was the location where we first meet them? Greg, they were in a cemetery. Ah, uh, yes, a cemetery. And let's listen to this. Caressing the Yes, caressing the marble and stone. I know surface level here, so they could have went with it there just for the, the, the gravestone. But at the same time, that song again in 1981, it was a part of the uh, ceremony. It was the B-side for a ceremony. And uh, that was one of the final tracks by Joy Division that re- they recorded together. And they demoed that at Graveyard Studios. It's really cool that they're using this gothic rock sound to accompany the Countess on her lone hunt. It is a wonderful example of how uh, one piece of art, the music, can just enhance another piece of art, the film. Next up, we catch up with Alex Lowe, who is doing a sort of house call. She's visiting a young patient who has the measles, as it turns out, and the anti-vaxxer mom is freaking out that she should have never given the uh, vaccination and Alex is like, uh, yeah, you should have. It kills a lot of people in the world, and you're lucky to be in the position you are. There are a lot of horrible things out there. This whole scene kind of, you can, you, you, you know it's, it's here because it shows basically what Alex has been going through, having lost a child and trying to kind of deal with that challenge yep. uh, moving forward and all the horrors that are out there. And to not, like, you know, take anything for granted, uh, any other, you know, for, for parents out there that are kind of worried about stuff. Hey. Finn doesn't like anti-vaxxers either. It's all good. <laughs> Finn has his own opinions. It's all good. Now, back at the hotel, John's in room 64, and he awakes. And guess what? At what time is it? It is around 2.25 again. Um, and this is where we see Miss Evers. She pops up, asks him for, you know, sheets. You know, like you do when, you, when you're at a hotel. You just creep in someone's room in the dark, and you let them In the know. middle of the night, yeah. Uh-huh, of course. <laughs> and now the hotel, of course, starts to screw with him. He sees the addiction demon in a uh, shot. I, I'm pretty sure it would scare the hell out of anybody <laughs> if you just look up Greg, at that. Again, 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 <laughs> Greg, this is when you and I and any other normal people, people or person out there would leave the hotel. If you woke up and you saw the addiction demon gyrating above your head with that thing. I mean, come oh, no, on, no, we're no, out. I, I, I'm dead or, or I'm in a, uh, a special, ho- uh, yeah, I'm running or I'm in a hospital. My hair is all gray and I haven't talked for 10 years. So yeah, it, it's bad. Then then, then, he, then he gets up out of the bed, right? And he's kind of like, you know, does the whole like, you know, wash your face, get you know, mm-hmm, check yourself in the mirror, make sure everything's normal as we see in a lot of horror movies. And then of course the shower curtain, you have to look behind the shower curtain, you know, of course. every, every horror movie has this trope. Um, he looks back there and then he sees two people going at it to be yep. like de- two ghosts dead people boning. going at it. All right. All right. Cool. Yeah. And then he wakes up from his, obviously he wakes up from his slumber. He had been dreaming that. Probably not. It's all real. You're in a haunted hotel. Mm -hmm. Um, You you should get out of there, bro. Nope. And then he sees one last thing. Of course, his uh, missing child, Holden. And now he's chasing Holden down the hallway. And all of this from the second he wakes up is just feels like something straight out of The Shining. Like they were trying to hit The Shining really hard here. Um, Definitely. And I, I thought it was, it was effective. I liked it. Speaking of The Shining, Greg, you're spot on with that. Uh, then he goes over, John Lowe goes over to the bar. Um, you know, yep. middle of the night, Sally McKenna's there. Um, 
Ghost. Liz, Liz, Liz is there, uh, you know, offering drinks, and she can just kind of tell, Sally can just kind of tell that he has struggled with his sobriety, that he has some kind of demons he's working, he's working through. Um, so they offer him a, um, a ginger ale to kind of sit down and take a seat and, and, and have a little conversation. Um, fun fact here, a little, a little fun nod here. Uh, Sally calls Liz Cleopatra. Um, now, of course, Elizabeth Taylor, the real life Elizabeth Taylor, was in the movie Cleopatra. So a fun little nod to the, the correlation between Liz Taylor, Elizabeth Taylor, the, act the actress, and uh, Cleopatra. And uh, this whole part serves to kind of get some context and backstory on John himself and kind of what he went through. We've seen, you know, flashes of what he went through in the, in the past about losing Holden. But now we kind of get a clearer picture. He kind of talks through um, what he was doing on the day of and kind of uh, how his life changed. Um, mm -hmm. And we realize that he's kind of been, he's seen, John has seen some stuff. He was investigating at what they thought at the moment was a murder-suicide uh, for a uh, wipes out an entire family. It turns out it was just um, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, and the dad came mm -hmm. home and saw that his family had died, and he shot himself afterwards. So, yes, that's going to drive uh, almost anybody out to a few drinks that night. He didn't come home for two days, came home. And then that's when he took the family out to the beach, uh, to the boardwalk, where they lose Holden. So this is where, and now we're really caught up to the events happening right now. Now back to Sally for a second. Now she gives us a little bit of her backstory with her. Um, she wrote for Patti Smith. Uh, she wrote a mm -hmm. few tracks for her. Uh, and then they didn't make the album. And John says, was it wasn't because of your, you know, your alcoholism or anything like that. And this is where we get another nod to that title itself, Shoots and Ladders, where she goes into just how it is for life and uh, the ups and downs. And I got lost. Kept trying to climb higher. Get closer to that light. Like an endless ladder where all you do is get further and further away. All right, then we pick up at the police station um, and John has a special package. It is, you know, he's been getting anonymous phone calls from Hotel Cortez from room 64, but now he's literally getting mail, Greg. Um, he's getting a package and then he calls the bomb squad in, doesn't know what the hell it is. And they open it up and they discover that is a, like an old Academy Award Oscar, right? Mm -hmm. Some blood on it. This all feels like something out of seven. Uh, like the, just what's the in setup. the box. Yeah. Or now you're waiting for detective. Detective. <laughs> now, Greg, back at Hotel Cortez, the new owner, Will Drake wants to throw a party fashion show uh so it's popping it's 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 a it's a scene over here right what we see literally naomi campbell playing yep. claudia bankson claudia bankson a nod to claudia schiffer and tyra banks i uh -huh. like what you did there ryan murphy um uh, she's there the whole party a uh, whole party's there and i love how west bentley john lowe just kind of completely ignores her just like oh okay yeah yeah. I, i'm looking uh -huh. for my daughter yeah yeah, 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 completely yeah yeah doesn't wants nothing to do with her um <laughs> So he's looking for his daughter who like just pops into the hotel like all the time. I, I don't know. She was dropped off by the cop who was like who a took cutter, her like the formula, the formula of a cop in every show ever. Right. Just like the most basic yeah. cop ever. Who I was just, you know, giving her a little joy ride around the town. You know, that's it. It's all good. Uh, yeah. OK. All right, buddy. On top of that, you have Liz uh, teaching apparently some people who work at Vogue how to Vogue. She even reads Naomi Campbell real quick, too. Skinny jeans are out, fringes in, ponchos are forever. Make a note of it. And now we hear Brian Ferry's Don't Stop the Dance. Uh, I'm assuming, um, because we, we hear it so much, Slave to Love was just too on the nose for this, so they didn't use it. <laughs> I, I just feel like they put that on there and thought, mm, no, this doesn't work. And now we meet Tristan Duffy. Now, how do you introduce a character uh, when you need to, you know, they're, they're edgy, they're, they're, you know, they're different. So what's the first thing you see? Oh, they're snorting coke. They're just slamming it. They're, or It's not even coke. I think he's slamming something else. We see pills. Uh, he is just yeah. doing it. I mean, Greg, that's, how, that's, that's the international. That's how you prove that he's a bad boy, right? You got <laughs> to quickly cut to him backstage doing drugs, you know, wrecking havoc. And then he doesn't really care what he's doing. He's kind of you know uh self-mutilating himself later on with the cut across like he's kind of at a at a crossroads uh, himself he's oh. struggling but he comes out and he just like he walks around like he owns the joint and he's like you know 
making out with people that aren't his girl <laughs> and then starting fights and literally he become he comes within like inches of attacking a man with a broken glass right uh -huh. but then yep. something stops him he notices the countess and and they connect eyes and he, he gaze. and they both kind of feel like this this uh you know this this pull between each other similar to what we saw um in the cemetery when she was kind of like you know Mm -hmm. seducing this couple um I, I you know obviously vampires have that kind of that power to do that as well meanwhile lachlan leads little scarlet down to where i guess they held the swimming pools at the time but now they're being used to house uh the little vampire children so he knew about this spot he takes her over there and then he says the line like, don't worry you can tap on the thing you can do whatever you want they don't wake up and sure enough holden does this watch We literally see this in every horror film or show that we watch, you know? It's like, you know, they, they, they promise you that nothing will happen if you do it, and then you do it, and then it literally <laughs> happens. So that was that was an obvious thing. I'm just wondering, like, how, like, you know, Lo has been through such a horrible experience with uh, how did he you know, lose her child that quickly? Yeah. How, how does he just like, how is he so trustworthy with these random strangers and his daughter? I don't know. I would be a little suspect moving forward for the rest of my life and kind of need to be maybe a little bit overprotective. Of I'd have that leash. After. I'd have that leash. We'd yeah. have that leash on them. <laughs> I'm with you on this, Greg, because <laughs> you don't just let, let let them wander around a hotel after you know the hotel has been kind of a little bit, you know, eerie you know, the last few nights you've been there. I'm putting a tracker on that on that kid. I'm putting something. It's going to be like Black Mirror. I'm going to put something on a little homing device, whatever. So somehow Tristan makes his way upstairs to the Countess's <laughs> uh, hotel room. And he breaks in, he's looking for coke, and why? Because he can smell it. He can smell it, apparently. <laughs> what? Oh, okay. Greg, Tristan needs to get a job at, like, at the airport, like, like a, like a drug-sniffing dog. Like, <laughs> I mean, this guy is, like, incredible. How, how the hell can he sm smell cocaine from, like, downstairs, <laughs> out of the room? I mean, come on. Ridiculous. Now Donovan catches him and he's just about to take him out right then and there before the Countess stops him, of course, because, well, at the time she says, meh, it's just a, meh, just let him go. But we know damn well that Countess, she has other plans in store for Tristan. She's just trying to back down Donovan at the moment. Yeah, and you can tell that Donovan is just, he's, he is completely kind of jealous and afraid that his, he's going to get swapped out. Yep. At this point. And, and this is a threat to his livelihood with the Countess, right? So he, He's, he's going to do anything he can to kind of get rid of this guy because he knows it's more it's probably likely that, you know, she's kind of just over him. She's, she's like sick and tired and like she's here forever and she has the power to do whatever she wants. And, um, you know, she's bored of him. So it's like, uh, you know, next one up. So he, he kind of sees that coming ahead of time. So he gets in that elevator, but unfortunately, it doesn't stop on the first floor. Where does it stop? On the seventh floor, where he gets out and all hell breaks loose for a minute. And this is where we meet James March. You look like you need a drink. And that accent is something else. Um, I, I dig it. I, <laughs> he's it's from a little like the Northeast. He's he's from the Boston area, Northeast somewhere. It's uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, a thick, little bit. Of Thick Brahmin yeah. uh, accent. It, it, it works. First, you're like, this is goofy. And then it keeps going. And it, it just grows on you. And the character. You're like, he's going for it. Yeah. Yeah, he's really going for it. The character works, though. I, I, I enjoyed it. And he's creepy as hell. And what an introduction, Greg. You meet James March. And he's like, hey, I got a prostitute here for you. Uh, kill her for me. Prove yourself. Here's Show me gun. what you can do. Here's a gun. Here's a gun. Uh, here Do you it. go. <laughs> I mean, that's quite the introduction, right? When you first meet somebody, but uh, he doesn't want to do it. Tristan's like, whoa, even this is a little bit too bad boy for me. Uh, <laughs> but March then shoots shoots the woman in her face right next to him. And he's like, whoa, what is going on in this hotel? Also notice that scar, that giant scar on March's neck when he takes off his scarf uh, for a brief moment. We'll come back to that a little bit later. Obviously, this tells us he's also one of the ghosts haunting this hotel. Now, when all is said and done, the Countess, she shows Donovan the door, sadly, in the most melodramatic scene I think I've seen in a long time on this show. It's just the music, everything. Yeah, the way that she delivers the news here, you know, she's been around for over 100 years. Um, a heartbreak to her isn't what you and I would consider something big, right? She's, it's, this is something that she's it's a clearly Tuesday. done numerous it's times. It's just a Tuesday for yeah, her. Yeah, it's, it's, 
Exactly. It's like it's nothing. It's like she she kind of counts the years based on the heartbreaks, and she's kind of gone through, you know, a, a cycle of this, uh, you know, having outlived all these people in her life, um, and kind of you know always seeking for the next person to kind of fill that void for her. So for her, this is nothing. He needs to get over it and get the hell out. Now, the roller coaster that Tristan is on is not over just yet, as again, uh, we get the Countess. She returns, stops him in the elevator, and turns him. So now he is one of them. He is also a vampire. And this is where we learn the rules of the vampires, at least in AHS. So then we get a straight up sex montage and we learn, uh, you know, the rules of, vam of the vampires in the uh, AHS universe, at least in this season. Um, you know, uh, the Countess and Tristan, uh, it, she explains everything with, to, to him, you know. Mm -hmm. They don't age, they're invulnerable, they live forever, but you also got to be careful and you can't, like, fall in love. You can't be reckless. You can still um, die. You know, you can still, you you can still, can still die. die. Yeah, you can still die. A stake to the heart, silver bullets, all that stuff works. Um, mm -hmm. You can go outside, but you really shouldn't because it takes away some of your vitality, right? Yes. Um, so he's kind of like, wow. Thank you for this gift. I mean, I, I welcome to the party. Like, I this is now I have a new, uh, I have a whole newfound, uh, you know, love for for this kind of new life that I'm going to lead. He was totally into it. Um, it's the key here. Also, you got to think about is that like she's very picky on who she chooses to turn. Right? Like some people are just victims for her to just drink their blood, but others, she decides that she actually wants to turn. So clearly, Tristan um, has some significance or value to her more so than just someone else that she picks up at the cemetery say or anyone else like she she finds value in him in, 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 a, in a physical if not something else attraction to him his penis um that his penis <laughs> yes <Greg. laughs> now back to the kids for a moment here i'm sorry about that segue whatever we gotta we gotta get back to uh john lowe's child she's returned she's left the house she snuck out she got on the bus she returned to the hotel no one saw her, apparently. So she can now, <laughs> and now she she makes her way up to go see Holden. She she doesn't know if it's really Holden. She shows him a family photo. He recognizes the family. She sees that he didn't age. So she's trying to figure out what's going on here. So she tries to take a photo mm -hmm. of him. He quickly like goes in for like a kiss or like I don't know if he's gonna bite her neck or or what. But she immediately freaks she's out. To smell her. Yeah. He's wanted to smell his older sister. Okay, all right, that's too close, too close. And so she gets the hell out of there immediately. But of course, we do learn even more rules about vampires in this sequence as well, right? We learn that they, once you chain, turn them, they don't age from past that date. So they can stay young or whatever state they were in when they were turned. Just stay out of the sun. And, but, but two, yeah, just stay out of the sun. But two, also, they do acknowledge or remember their life before it, right? They don't get like wiped, they don't get like wiped clean. They know exactly where they came from and, and who they are, but there's no mm -hmm. there's no emotional attachment to like the people in their past life. Like he's happy with just like, you know, candies, candy and some yeah. video games. And he's like, I don't care about mom and dad. Like, yeah. it, you know, it's he's completely like like non -ex they're like non-existent yeah. to him. And the Countess, meanwhile, she uh, her favorite timeline happens to be what the 70s during the disco era, Lady Godiva. I, I love it. Now, after Scarlett takes that creepy photo of her younger brother, um, she runs out the room just like completely scared, and runs into an even scarier <laughs> sight, which is Sally McKenna grinding her teeth. Greg, this was disgusting. Uh, and, and grinding her teeth, they're crumbling, blood's going everywhere. And she's just doing it kind of to horrify the young girl or she sees the young girl as maybe a victim in the future. Um, she takes a liking to her. She literally says the, one of the funniest lines so of good. the episode here. Kids are the best. I got a heavy Michael yes. Keaton Beetlejuice vibe here. I'm sorry. I love it. Not so fast, brown boy. We're going to have some laughs. <laughs> Now, Scarlett makes her way home. She sees the cops, and I have a feeling she realizes that this is probably for me, as John and yeah. uh, Alex are there, and they are freaking out. She reveals herself, and uh, they have a little bit of a heart-to-heart -heart moment where she tells him straight up, you lied to me, Holden is alive, and this just freaks out one John, and Alex doesn't know where to take it. And she even brings up the fact that she, uh, apparently there's still some uh, blame for what happened to Holden, apparently, and yeah. she takes it out on John. Yeah, obviously it's difficult for the family to to overcome what they went through, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So at one point, at one th on one side, you're thinking, oh, you need to kind of help the a young child cope with the loss of a sibling. But 
what we know and what we've seen is that John himself has actually come in contact with Holden in the hotel. So he's kind of like on 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 the fence of like what's real is is she telling the truth if she also saw him at the hotel, right? So maybe there is some truth to this to this idea that he is still alive and that he's in the hotel itself as crazy as that might sound. Mm-hmm. So it kind of threw his whole um his reality kind of it threw a whole um, for, for, for a whirlwind because he doesn't know what to believe at this point. So he looks at that blurry photo and he decides it's time to head back to the hotel and get some answers where he talks to Iris and she tells him everything. Well, she kind of really just reveals the hotel and that it's haunted and there are ghosts here and it was built by James March. And this is where we get March's origin story. Now, the hotel is just a large trap created by March in the 1920s. Uh, It brings in victims one by one. And we learn that one, he was killing them at a clip of like three a week, apparently. He would seal people in brick walls, even including one scene where someone's screaming for help. Uh, so he muzzles her. Time now for another not so fun fact, Greg. Um, the actual builder that he mentions, the architect that uh, uh, James March mentions here is Julia Morgan. Um, for his it was his first choice for designing the hotel, but it falls through because she wanted to pay her workers, uh, you know, a reasonable wage. Mm-hmm. He, he didn't want to do that. But Julia Morgan is actually best known for her long collaboration with the William Randolph Hearst Building, the Hearst Castle in San Simeon, California. Julia Morgan is also known for some buildings in the San Francisco area um, uh, following the 1906 earthquake, um, one of which the Fairmont is still up and around today. So a fun little like history fact. Well. Not so fun, but, um, uh, you know, it's rooted in some sort of real life history. But, uh, you know, James March didn't use her. He went another way. He even went so far as to um, kill the man that was in charge Mm -hmm. of construction. We see a kind of a flashback where uh, the guy kind of called him out on the design of the place. And, hey, this this isn't like a normal hotel. What's going on? And then he kills the guy because he kind of got a little bit too close to, to, you know, what was actually going on. So. James March, a uh, complete psychopath, serial killer, um, and we kind of see the you know the shoots and ladders literally come manifested in the actual building of this this hotel. Now another history lesson here is that this hotel, or at least this theme and everything going on, James March is possibly heavily heavily inspired by H. H. Holmes and his murder castle mm-hmm. he had during the Great World's Fair. And this is just a friendly reminder to please read Eric Larson's Devil in the White City if you haven't done that yet. It's one of my favorite I books. I still need to read it, Greg. Please I still need to read it. Read this book and there is a movie or TV series or I don't know what the hell it's going to be now from Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> DiCaprio and yeah. um, uh, Scorsese have been working on this for quite some time. I have no I don't think it's ever going to happen, but apparently it's with Hulu now, so we'll see. Hopefully it happens. Uh, I cannot wait. Now, one of the main motivators for James March, we learn, is that his uh, complete disdain for religion um, probably uh, pushed down his throat when he was young. Uh, I think he just kind of completely uh, hated all the teachings that he was kind of uh, told when he was little. Uh, wanted to get rid of all the Bibles in, in the hotel, and anyone who kind of prayed to God, he literally would just murder you and say, I'm going to now... Uh, my, my, my life's work is going to be to kill God, to do so much harm to so many people out there that they lose, lose faith in God. And that's kind of like his, his marching orders, James March, mm-hmm. wants to do for the rest of the, of, of the season that we see. And this links back up to John Lowe and his investigation of these murders that are going on in the city. And then the last one where he finally gets the Oscar statue and he's starting to put things together here. And he's starting to notice that these killings are matching up with the Ten Commandments. Honor thy father and mother. The Ten Commandments? You're saying someone's picked up where this this March guy left off? Maybe. And of course, like you do at the beginning of a series, the main character doesn't believe any of this. He's not buying it one bit. We're only two episodes in, so of course he's not into this or anything that has to do with ghosts, whatever. It's all bull. So he's going to go back to the hotel. Yeah, Iris would make a better, you know, TV writer than an actual, <laughs> like, you know, it, it, the story is completely made up, he thinks. Um, it doesn't make any sense. But uh, I think 
sooner than later he's going to realize that wow uh a lot of it is true and it's and it's it's he's going to be th you know thrust into the middle of it and for the final scene here we end with another bloodbath when it comes to the vampires now that tristan's a vampire he's got to be on the hunt too and what does he use he uses a grinder yeah. uh to find a victim this time <laughs> poor dude poor guy he just he just wanted to hook up and then get out of there he didn't expect this and then lady gaga comes in he's not cool with this too bad stab game over yeah, it's kind of a moment where Lady Gaga's uh, not only like very turned on by what she's seeing, but also, you know, the person that she turned his first kill as a vampire. Yay, let's celebrate by murdering this innocent guy. What a fun moment, Greg. It looks like Tristan will have no problem being a vampire. Um, he's already getting the hang of it. Yep. Um, and we'll be back next week for yet again another breakdown of American Horror Story Hotel Episode 3. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, guys, everyone take care. Hope you guys are binge watching AHS with us at home. Stay safe, and we will see you soon. Bye. Love ya.